Have you ever wondered how to utilize influencer marketing to help your business grow? Well, I have a very special guest today with us. Christy, who successfully managed to turn her bootstrap venture clever into a multi-million dollar company. Clever, which Christy founded in 2009, pairs brands with social media influencers. Today, this network is no joke. Clever girls reach about 75 million women a month. Christy spent the better part of the last decade translating the amazing aspects of social media, those embodied by the Batkin phenomena. With breaking news from San Francisco's Hall of Justice, Police Chief Greg Sir called an impromptu press conference where he issued a very urgent message. Gotham City needs you, Batman. So cool and posted it to their Facebook page. A blogger picked it up and the rest is history. It went viral and now we have thousands of people who are coming to cheer miles on. Next here tonight, a story we simply love. The entire American city had transformed itself into Gotham City. Like all of San Francisco turned out to make a little boy's wish come true. Big shout out from President Obama. Have a listen. Way to go, Miles. Way to save Gotham. That clever spearheaded into business principles, notably that authenticity rules. Users are actually human beings and great stories always win the day. In 2016 and 17, Inc. 5000 has recognized Clever as one of the fastest growing companies in America. And this is in addition to being a mom to her two kids, ages seven and nine. So I'd like to invite Christy to join us to discuss influencer marketing. Many of the questions I'm about to ask today have come directly from you. So let's begin. What are some benefits of running an influencer marketing campaign? And when is the right time to add an influencer to a brand? That's a good question, a great way to start off. The influencer marketing can do a lot of things. Um, and can achieve a lot for a brand, but like with any marketing tactic, um, you have to know what your goal is and why you're using it. And I guess that's really what you're asking, but it can't do all things at all times for all people. And I think sometimes, um, especially those who are newer to influence marketing, they kind of want it to do everything. So, I mean, the reason it, it is useful and successful and works because um, it lends a very authentic voice to a brand. Consumers are more media savvy than ever. Um, kids are more media savvy than ever. They're growing up being advertised to, being sold to all the time. And they, they know what marketing is and they know they're being marketed to. Um, so it's very different when it comes from somebody they know or trust. And so influencers fall into that category, even though, you know, at, this, at a super high level, influencers are like celebrities. And then you kind of get into a celebrity spokesperson situation. But for the most part, the smaller, what we call micro influencers, you know, feel like our friends are the people we follow on Instagram. They kind of, we let them into our lives. We follow them. We're inspired by them. So what influencer marketing does really is kind of lend that layer of, as I said, authenticity to marketing where don't take it from the brand, take it from somebody else. And the hard part for the brand is letting somebody else talk about your brand without using, you know, a copywriter and without using specific brand guidelines. I mean, you can give them some guidelines, but you really want them. It has to be authentic. It has to be real. Uh, so authenticity is a big part of it. Um, establishing trust with consumers and of course, accessing their audiences. I mean, that's the big, that's, that's why it's so interesting is because you're both getting the content and you're getting uh, exposure to entirely new audiences. Is influencer marketing appropriate for every brand? What industries does influencer marketing work best for? Well, in general, B2C companies. Um, we do a lot of work with consumer packaged goods, kind of anything you would buy at Target. Obviously, there's lots of room um, in the beauty market, in the fashion industry, and those industries lend themselves to working with influencers pretty obviously and early on. But 
you know, we have influencers of all shapes and sizes and colors and, you know, really just anything that's being marketed to the consumers. Um, it's a little harder in the B2B world, but I mean, just because it's more niche and it's a little bit harder to find those folks who are very influential about a specific thing, but find influencers who look like your customer. So it's, it's kind of, it kind of works for anybody. Which is your favorite influencer marketing campaign and why? Well, there's, there, that's a good question. There have been a lot. Uh, we have done, yes, we, 2019 will actually be our 10 year anniversary. My favorite program that we've done, which isn't exactly what you're asking, but we did this great program for Bob's Red Mill. You've probably seen them. They do all the alternative. It's a great company. They're great products. And we came to them with an idea to do this thing called the 50 States of Cookies. Uh, and it was right up around election time. So everybody was feeling very angsty. And mm -hmm. we were like, well, everybody loves cookies. So why don't we do this kind of bring us all together with cookies and which sounds, you know, kind of basic, but it was really, really fun. So we found food influencers in each of the 50 states who made a cookie representative of that state. The reason I like the campaign so much was because aside from that just being a fun thing, Bob's put that content on their website. So you could find, you know, there's a, literally a map and you could click on each of the states and get those states uh, recipes, those state cookie recipes. And it's a very, it was a very easy program for the influencers to do because they were able to use any of the Bob's products. Be authentic. There was nothing inauthentic about making a great cookie. You know, it doesn't feel salesy and it's, and it was fun. They enjoyed it. And then we kicked off the program actually. Martha Stewart and Jeffrey Zakarian made the first cookie for the, for the program. From a mechanical standpoint, it was awesome because Martha did that on Facebook Live. We had Facebook Live first and we had that content to share out. Then we had food bloggers and we had them sharing out. And then we had people who are even like nano influencers who could then boost that content, Twitter and Instagram. And so the content was kind of everywhere. It was a really big integrated program with great content that made everybody happy. Do you foresee any changes in influencer marketing in the upcoming five years? Yeah, I do. And, you know, predictions are tricky. But as I said, when we started, Instagram didn't even exist. So when we began, we were mostly concentrating on bloggers and mostly concentrating on moms. because That's where our brands wanted to be, not because we necessarily only like working with moms. So the, the thing about influencers is that, you know, we don't know where the next platform is going to come from, but it's going to come with all the changes we see in Facebook. And um, I mean, we don't, we don't know if that's how that's going to go. And snap was really big, but then it was really hard to measure anything there. So then that kind of got, you know, came and went. YouTube is a powerhouse, but you know, short form videos are still really big, even though vine was discontinued. So I'm talking about all these things that used to exist. I think the, the really tough part, again, kind of from a business perspective about influencer is that, yes, the platform's change, you kind of got to change with it. But one of the things that's happened is that a lot of, um, once it became clear that influencer marketing wasn't going away, here, it's like social media. As long as there's social media, there's going to be influencer marketing. So then everybody wanted in on it. And everybody is now an expert on influencer marketing. And um, a lot, a lot of companies came out of nowhere um, with platforms as the solution. Like, yes, mm -hmm. you can do influencer, but you can use this platform to do it. You don't need to hire a full service agency, which we are. And um, a lot of companies are like, why would I hire an agency if I can just do it myself? So the industry kind of moved that way. And I think a lot of clients and partners realize that just because you have the tools to do it doesn't mean it's any easier. You still have to troubleshoot. You still have to, you know, do QA. You still have to manage a program. And it's, it's a lot. It's, it's tricky. It's hard. It's time consuming. So now I think it, everything's kind of evening out where brands and agencies are realizing that it does take a lot of time to do it well. Um, and you really want kind of a balance of the tech solution and the, the full service solution. So, and that's really kind of where we are now going into 2019, um, bracing ourselves for whatever platform comes next in terms of users. What is one myth about influencer marketing that you want to debunk? Well, there's a few, there's a few things really that I think are misperceptions that linger. Um, one is that 
you don't need to disclose or could we just not disclose this and keep it between us that this is a sponsored thing and funny thing about that is that no <laughs> no we can't we have to disclose it's actually illegal to not disclose and what's funny er about that is that that's not new that's been around the FTC wrote guidelines about disclosing sponsorships about a decade ago it's still new to some people that that exists, mm -hmm. um, but it's out there, it's downloadable, it's written, it's a PDF, it's written in plain English about what you can and cannot do and what you must disclose. It's not hard to follow it. First of all, you have to disclose. But second of all, mm -hmm. um, that doesn't make it bad or worse. In fact, trying to lie about it or get away with it is way worse um, because generally people find out and then they feel duped. Um, whereas if somebody says, I was paid to do this, or I was sent this product to try this out and here are my, here are my real thoughts about it. Influencers know how to talk about a product without, you know, and if, and if there's negative aspects of it, they can talk about that too. And it makes it seem real. It's like reading, it's like reading, um, customer reviews on Amazon. Mm -hmm. So disclosing is important. It doesn't ruin a campaign, paying people to, do this is part of the whole, is part of advertising. So that's my last one in terms of myths. The idea that it's pay for play, that if I pay the influencers, then they're going to say nice things about me. And that's mm -hmm. not what it is. It's you're paying for their time, you're paying for their work, and you're paying for access to their audience. And you have to think of it that way. It's a professional business exchange, but you're not hiring a copywriter who's going to say exactly what you want them to say with these words or like re, you know, reposting press releases or something. What is the first step to identifying and evaluating the right influencer? How do you find them? Are there any tools that can help? Yeah, there are a lot of agencies that have, um, some agencies have their own network. That's how we operate. Not everybody does. There's a lot, a lot of tools out there that help you find influencers. You can do it all kinds of different ways. But the real approach, I think the best approach to finding somebody you want to work with is know who you want to work with. Who is going, who are you trying to reach? You know, who is it that you think really represents your brand um, or is your ideal consumer and start with that profile and build a profile of who you're looking for. And it makes it a lot easier to search. You know, Google is your friend and, and can actually help you find influencers. You know, and I also want to say too that bigger isn't necessarily better. You can find lists everywhere um, mm -hmm. in terms of the top blah, 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 blogger, top influencer that's a, you know the, the people who make the top lists overwhelmed with pitches from brands and are very expensive and that's not necessarily going to get you what you want you know so bigger isn't necessarily better but you can go you know you can start simply by googling something like lifestyle blogger and mm -hmm. finding folks that way it's very very easy now to go to instagram and just look for popular hashtags um, for your industry or what you're trying to sell and then see who the top posts are by. Um, and sometimes again, the, Instagram does a great job in terms of helping you discover folks who aren't necessarily the biggest people by just searching industry hashtags, look at your competitors and see who they're working with. That's a pretty easy, but really useful thing to do. And depending on your industry. Um, so I live in Napa um, and I talk to wineries a lot even though they're, you know, we have a, we have a few wine brands, you know, so one of the things that we encourage people to do is look at um, location tags in Instagram to see mm -hmm. who is visiting and writing about it and, you know, and tapping into people that way. And then I also recommend, you know, uh, any brand look at their own social channels and see who's first to comment and comments all the time. And is always there. Sometimes you can find find and far, um, form really great relationships with people who, who, are natural, who are already natural fans, you know, who are there in your, in your feeds. That's the, just to get started finding folks, the influencers who work for them to not post about any competitive anything. And we do our best and it doesn't, we don't always win this battle, but we do our best to um, recommend not doing that. Because the reality is that I, for most or many things that I purchase, I'm not necessarily brand loyal forever, especially if, I'm, if we're talking about cooking, for instance. I'm going to try different things and try different types. And so it, by kind of cornering an influencer into only buying your brand and only talking about your brand, 
it, it comes back to feeling salesy and a little too mm -hmm. unbelievable. So exclusivity clauses, which our brands love, we try, we try and steer away from. So, um, so going to a competitor. So, okay. So somebody posted about this, you can buy this and that maybe, and, and, and compare because that's what we do as consumers. So what is the best way to pitch an influencer? What are some of your favorite email headlines? I love so much that you ask, are asking this because um, it really does come down to the relationship you're forming with your influencers. Um, and part of the challenge we saw when I was talking about kind of the platforms that have been set up to work with influencers is that you lose that human touch. And you're not dealing with ad units, you're dealing with human beings. The most effective, <laughs> the most effective email headlines is just saying like what your brand is um, and is interested in partnering with you. Interested in a, in a paid partnership with you. Mentioning money always helps. And just being really straightforward about, you know, being, being thoughtful, being professional. And I, I think one of the challenges or one of the problems or one of the bad things that we've seen um, are when brands reach out to influencers having no idea what other work the influencer has done and assuming that, be, that, that actually the influencer should be flattered that they're being reached out to. Um, and so it's like, well, we have decided we want to work with you. Well, I mean, that if, if the influencer is doing her job, she's getting five, 10, 20, 100 pitches a day. My two business partners uh, was a mom blogger for a while, and she, she had um, up to 100 uh, email pitches every day. So it's really, you know, just, just be straightforward about what it is that you're asking. You're interested in this paid partnership. And here's what you'd like them to do. And the good ones will get back to you. About what percentage of your marketing budget should be used when hiring an influencer? That's a good question. Um, budgets are all over the place. In this respect, I think the influencer landscape is still the Wild West. We have great people who will do an Instagram post for $300. We have great people who will do an Instagram post for $3,000, $15,000, all over the place. So in terms of what your marketing budget is for this, you kind of have to back into it and it should be, you know, I think somewhere around maximum of a, th of a third of your marketing budget, I think would be amazing. I don't think most people are willing to do that. Maybe a quarter um, and it could be even less than that, but definitely cannot be a hundred percent of your budget. Don't do that. Unless you have a very, very, very aggressive and specific, um, market, you know, I mean, we've all seen diet detox tea. You can manage to get it into the hands of like super celebrities. I mean like Kardashian level or model level, but, but those are the rare cases in general. It should, you know, it needs to be part of the mix because once the, once like everything else in marketing, you know, somebody has to be aware of the brand, has to hear it a certain number of times or see it a certain number of times before they're motivated to purchase, before they even remember it, let alone motivated to purchase. And you can't go from like brand awareness to purchase in the same, in one Instagram post. You know, so if we're thinking about your budget and you're thinking about what you're going to spend and what you're going to get, um, it should come out of your content marketing budget, a little bit of your social media budget, a little bit of your content budget, because you're getting content you can repurpose. You're getting advocates, you're getting, you know, photos, copy, all kinds of stuff um, that you can reuse. So, so that's how to justify some of this budget. And then again, you're building awareness or, I mean, it could be a more of a direct marketing take that you, you have, you know, where you want it to be like, yes, just push the coupon out. But it can't be all things in one go with nothing else supporting. You know, you have to have a program that's having a sale or having a, you know, build a mm -hmm. program that has a coupon. What is it that you're promoting? Yeah, 25%, I would say, is probably the sweet spot. What are some benefits of hiring an agency? What should you expect from the influencer? Is there any industry standards? What is a good compensation rate for influencers? Yeah, I mean, I, I think as much as you are looking for the right influencer, the good influencers are looking for the right brands because that's the, you know, that's the other side of the coin when you are an influencer. A lot of times readers don't mind that your audience doesn't mind if you're getting sponsored work. They kind of expect it. But, but if you do something that seems inauthentic or off brand, they will call you out. <laughs> they, no. Um, and so, you know, an organic 
uh, somebody who prefer, you know, who's living a, a, an organic, if you go to, you know, if somebody is a vegan, she's not going to do a post that involves, you know, meat products or eggs or, I mean, it's, it seems really obvious, but, but there, that is very obvious. Sometimes it's not as obvious, but audiences are prickly uh, and influencers know that. So they want to be aligned with your brand as much as you want that. Um, and then the other thing that we always get feedback is that you really, as I mentioned, you want to be really clear about what it is you're asking them to do. You know, we get feedback all the time from influencers who are grateful that our, we have instructions, like do this, do this, then do this. You know, and we're not telling them what to say, but it's just, these are the things you, you know, these are the elements you must include. And they're grateful because it's like a lot of times the brands will just kind of be like, here's some money and here's a product Do do a thing. So kind of tie it back to what inspires influencers. I mean, they want, again, they want to be aligned with your brand and they want to do a good job, but you know, they, they want guidance too. And because you're paying them, you can provide that. I mean, there is that professional relationship and we, we encourage you to create contracts for your influencers and, you know, really make it as professional as, as a relationship as you can. Um, we have the experience. Uh, we do it all <laughs> for you. It's really about budget versus time with Zeitgeist in San Francisco. They have a, they sell a t-shirt that says fast, friendly service, pick two. You know, the service isn't going to be so great or you can have fast service, but it's not going to be friendly, you know? And, and so I think of that a lot when I think about influencer and, you know, it's going to be time consuming or expensive. It could be both, but it can't be neither. It can be fast and it can't be free. Um, so if you're going to do it yourself in house, you have to realize that you're taking on a lot because it is, it's a little bit like herding cats. Um, as I said, influencers are not ad units. So getting them to do exactly what you want and exactly when you want it is tricky, especially if you're doing a large scale program. If you're working with one or two influencers, different story. But if you're trying to really make an impact and deal with 15 or 20 or 300, it's a different story. So yes, yeah, so it's, you know, we have a network of influencers. They're already pre-vetted. That's how we start our process. We have a lot of information about them. Um, we know they're not going to go off the rails. We know they're going to do a good job and we manage that. So, uh, so it's taking work off the plate. It's, and then you can also, you know, you can get mad at us if it doesn't work. So there's that. If we say mm -hmm. you're paying us this amount of money here's what we're guaranteeing you will get. You will get this much content. You will get this much reach. You know, we can't, we can mostly guarantee engagement. Sometimes things take off, you know, we're not going to promise virality ever, but uh, sometimes things take off. If budget is an issue, how would a small business DIY influencer marketing? How much time should a business owner block to create and launch a campaign if they were going to do it themselves? That is a very good question. And it really depends on how many influencers you want to use. Uh, as I said, using one is entirely, is an entirely different beast than using 20 or 25. The other problem, um, or let's call it a challenge, is that a lot of the work isn't like you can't just sit down and then it's done if you dedicate you know i'm going to sit down for six hours and the whole campaign will be done it's a lot of spinning plates really because you may send the outreach email to your influencers in one batch or in one succession but how fast they get back to you is entirely up to them and and when they get back to you so it's lots of spreadsheets you know and and you can use the platform as i said i mean there's lots of platforms set up for this but it's really all over the map I wish I could give you a specific answer, but I, I think it's really more about, you know, just thinking through all of the pieces. So there's the, what are we going to ask them to do and who, who are we looking for and what do we want from them? Mm -hmm. Then it's the searching, then it's the outreach, then it's the, okay, they've, they've replied. Now we have to know, now we have to tell them exactly what to do and when to do it. And then we have to make sure that they're actually doing it, you know, and whether that's t checking 20 websites regularly or 50 or five is a very different story. Even with the best of intentions and the best influencers, you still have to check their work and you have to decide whether you're going to do that before the posts go live or after the posts go live. There's benefits to both, you know, time mostly is the benefit of checking it afterwards. But, you know, sometimes, you know, as I said, even those with the best of intentions will spell Ghirardelli wrong because it's a hard word, to, it's a hard brand to spell. Right. And then what are you going to do afterwards? And what are you measuring? And how are you going to measure it? Who's measuring it for you? So it's just, there's just a lot of pieces. Um, like any, you know, like any other marketing 
tactic, uh, but you really need a, a plan. Um, and it's that, you know, we, <laughs> you should see our activity tracker, um, our project managers and what their timesheets look like. So much is lost to those like one-off emails or you have mm -hmm. a 15, you know, 15 threaded emails with each influencer. Um, and at any given time, it didn't take more than a minute, but that minute times 15 times 50 influencers adds up. It's not all just in one hour. It's just as they come in and I would actually even break it down into days. If you spend, again, depending on the size of your program, 15 or 20 minutes or half hour or an hour every day to just address all of these things, because, you know, and this is, this goes back to, to like workflow management, but you know, mm -hmm. how are you going to manage these communications with so many different people? Um, when I say influencers are people, not ad units, you know, ad units can't email you back. <laughs> ad units are not coming back to you saying, yeah, I was going to post, but then somebody had to, you know, we had a family emergency or we've had women not post because they went into labor. Don't worry about post about orange juice. Go have your baby. Typically speaking, will influencers come to service establishments like restaurants when you invite them? That is a really good question. And yes, and there's a caveat. <laughs> So it's a great use of influencers if you are a local, if you are a local business and you want foot traffic and you want to have people come use your, use your service, eat at your restaurant, visit your tasting room, whatever it is. But um, it's hard to get people to, to go somewhere. Um, it usually costs more money. And the best thing to do is to not ask them to be at a very specific event. Everybody wants to, but it's really hard to get influencers, especially more than one, to go to a certain place at a certain time on a certain day. It's just hard. Uh, so if you're like, can you go during the week of, um, you know, because again, these are living, breathing people, often parents and working people who have a job that isn't just taking pictures of their food. And, you know, um, and so trying to get them to go to an event that's a sponsored event, unless it's like a crazy fun thing and really awesome. I mean, which I'm sure, you know, many things are, but, you know, but trying to, I mean, we actually had, I won't name the brand, but we actually had uh, a, a brand that wanted influencers to attend a session. Um, it was sponsored and there was a, like a B-list celebrity. We'll go ahead and say B-list, maybe C-list. Celebrity, mm -hmm. kind of funny, talk about bladder leakage. And they're like, but it's going to be fun. There's like hors d'oeuvres and drinks. And we're like, it's still about bladder leakage. And like, I, I don't, yeah, tough. So um, if you're just like, hey, come, come down at some point and here's what we expect from you very different than being like, there's this event at this time and here's what, you know, here, here's, you can do it, but it's just, it's a lot harder to get people to show up. And if you're really counting on them to be there and then they don't come, which happens a lot, it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's tricky. So yes, you can get people to attend, but generally events are a little bit, specific events are harder. What is the most common mistake you see business owners making when they start influencer marketing? What are some pitfalls to avoid? I think we've, touched on a bunch of them. I think it's really the idea that it's going to be easy or it's, or, or cheap or that the influencers are you doing you a favor. I mean to, or sorry, that you're doing them a favor. The approach of like, oh, well, of course they should do everything we ask them to because we're so great. I think that those are the biggest ones. And I also think the idea that you don't have to pay them, um, that's still fairly pervasive. Um, mm. The influencers won't do that, but unless they're really small, but just the assumption that, well, if we send products, I mean, again, it, everything is, everything depends on everything else. If you're sending them shoes, you, if you're sending them beautiful shoes, that's a different thing than if you're sending them toothpaste, you know, it really does depend on, on, um, on what you're asking them to do. I think that's the other piece is that you want to be reasonable in your asks. We have programs where we have to ask, we ask the people to go to the store and buy a specific product and then come back and cook with it and take images and write a recipe. And we factor all of that into what we pay them. That's asking a lot if we can't just ship a product. Um, what if the store doesn't, if it's a new product and the store doesn't have it yet? That's happened a whole bunch of times. I think if you're relatively new and you're want to avoid all the pitfalls. It's really about planning and just thinking through what it is you want to get out of the program and taking all this other stuff into consideration. 
What type of ROI should a business look for? Are, what are some characteristics of a successful influencer marketing campaign? Yeah, I mean, this is the, you know, this is the million dollar question, but it's really important for any brand to know what they want to get out of a program. Are you looking for awareness? Are you trying to build awareness? If you're looking to build awareness, what metrics make sense to build awareness? Well, how many people saw your content? How many people saw your content is the first, you know, top layer. So then we're going to look at impressions and we're going to look at how to get you the most impressions possible. How are we going to get you those eyeballs? If you really want, you're like, okay, well, yeah, we want people to see it, but it's more important for us that people understand our product. It's more mm. important that like we're building this awareness, but it's not just, we don't want the brand name. I think they get that. We really want them to understand what the benefits of this product are. Well, okay. So then you, let's look at engagement. You know, let's really focus on a program where, you know, the influencers might not be as big, but their engagement level is really good. You know, so you're going to, they're going to post about this thing and then we're going to see the comments and we're going to see that it was reposted and we're going to see people really did something with that content that showed that they understood um, and were engaged with that, you know, with that content. Everybody wants to boost sales. Well, all of this is to boost sales, but if you really just want to track, you know, site visits, you know, how many people went to your site and what did they, how much did they spend? We're going to recommend a program that's much more focused on that direct response um, method. You know, so it's going to be people pushing a coupon out. It's going to be people pushing out. Did you know so-and-so is having a sale or have you ever visited this website? And it's going to be the call to action is going to be, you know, go here now we'll have many more instances of that. So it's not necessarily big, high um, people with big audiences, but lots of different people pushing out that, that content. There's a lot of talk about micro influencers. What's your view on micro influencers compared to celebrity influencers? Yeah, um, so we think of it as like, you know, the influencer pyramid. And at the top you have your social celebrities. They may be celebrities in real life, or maybe they're just popular for being on social media. I mean. YouTube stars or my kids know more YouTube stars than actual TV stars. And then you have the kind of this mid tier, um, what we, what we call like the micro influencers. And then you have the base of the pyramid, which is, um, like nano influencers or friend to friend influencers is kind of what we call them. They're normal people. Um, and there's a, there's a role for everyone to play. So at the top of the pyramid, you have these social celebrities, they get many more inquiries. So you're competing just for their time. They're going to be much more expensive, but you're going to get big numbers. You will see high, usually high engagement, but you, you know, you will get, you'll get the impressions. And if you get that sweet spot and that one person who's really compelling, you know, Kardashian-esque, maybe step down from that, you can see really great success. Um, again, if, especially if it's a brand they already know because they're not learning about it for the first time, uh, mm -hmm. they may be inspired to take action. Um, the one thing to note though, is that as you go up the pyramid, sentiment like the 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 sentiment being you know that you can see in the uh comments and from the audience goes down uh, and engagement tends to go down so as you go up the pyramid engagement rates go down and sentiment is like you're so stupid and you know and then you have 10 comments of people being like if you don't like it why are you following the celebrity at all and and then the comments just get all weird and negative and like much more likely to be problematic as you go up you know to fancier people. That sweet spot in the middle, and I would say a micro-influencer is somebody who has maybe 10,000 followers to 100 or 200,000 followers, you know, right there, mid-level. And their pay range is all over the place, but they haven't, you know, their engagement's higher, the sentiment is higher, people are still excited for them to get sponsored content and sponsored opportunities. They're harder to find because they're not going to come up in these lists, but you can find them as we talked about, like through Instagram or through Google and finding bloggers and kind of, you know, that, that mid range, looking at who's already posting sponsored content. And that's, you know, that's kind of, you can do more with them because it's not just kind of one and done. You spent all of the money on this one big person here. You can spread it around a little bit. And then the nano influencers, again, more like just your average person, you know, I have, I don't know, a thousand friends on Facebook, something like that. But if I recommend a lipstick or if I send out a coupon or let somebody know about a sale, my friends are going to pay attention. I mean, they're going to be, Oh, great. Mm -hmm. No. Okay. You know, and you, because they don't have as much reach, they are much, much more likely to cost less.
spot the bots, um, but that's not 100% guaranteed. It's just a best guess based on behavior, but mm -hmm. you actually kind of have to look at it in order to figure it out. I mean, we had to build our own tool internally because the ones we were trying to use, it's, 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 it's a mess. So the problem with like a baseline engagement, I mean, I think somewhere 5%, 10%, 7% is somewhere in the average, but I mean, that can skyrocket, especially if you have somebody who has, you know, if you're talking to somebody who has a couple thousand followers, engagement's just probably going to be higher. Then you also have to take into consideration the kind of content they're putting out. So sponsored content that involves a puppy is going to look entirely different than sponsored content that's like a PSA or, you know, something for a boring home improvement, something or other, you know, like, I don't know, like something about saving energy it's boring to me and but like oh god okay it's an energy saver device like great but that's not a puppy frolicking and so and and also what am i supposed to respond to this thing you know if you if you can't get that creative with the content it's really hard to you know absolutely guarantee engagement rates but you know i think seven percent is pretty good to learn more about influencer marketing do you have any blogs books or tools or resources that you would recommend well, I mean, certainly there is, I, we, it's, it's a little old now actually, but we did write the dummies guide to influencer marketing and we have a lot of resources on our uh, website about specific programs. And actually we just, we haven't, um, we've soft launched. We are officially launching uh, in January, the influencer marketing association. We're very excited about it because I think, you know, it's taken us to this point. Influencer marketing kind of used to fall under other buckets it's still getting pushed around a little bit by, you know, ad guys and media guys and I'm using guys on purpose, but cause we are female owned and operated. So programmatic world operates one way and you know, agencies operate a different way. And it's taken a while for influencer marketing to be its own thing. We are, you know, it is kind of pushed around a little bit by advertising people who want it to fit advertising models and advertising spends and advertising metrics. And so when you're talking about the ROI, we keep, they keep trying to like shove influencer marketing into models that already exist, but you know, engagement metrics don't necessarily lend themselves to other metrics that already exist. And it's just, it's just kind of muddy in terms of what, what it's supposed to do and how it's supposed to be measured. So we have some exciting um, members on the board from, you know, we have some big agencies on the board. We have some big platforms on the board so everybody can come together and really say this is what it should look like and this is this is how we should be doing it so there'll be a lot of resources coming out of that but the influence marketing association.org exists and so that would be a great place and great people to start with i know you also have small kids do you have any tips on keeping a positive work-life balance first of all very lucky that we work from home that in itself lends itself to, to some flexibility. So we're virtual. We use Slack. So we are all in touch with each other all the time. It's not linear. You know, it's not that, oh, I, you know, my, my, I, my lines are blurred. And I think sometimes people, I think sometimes we get frustrated when we try to be like, no, work is work and home is home. And they, that's it. And that's just how it's going to be. And then it doesn't happen and you feel like you're failing because it's not happening. And so I gave up trying to believe that a long time ago. <laughs> and just, it's just kind of, it is what it is and, and kind of being real and being flexible and being real to myself about when I'm, when I'm a little burnt out and need a break from either the kids stuff or the agency mm -hmm. stuff. But I also um, rely very heavily on my two business partners. I don't know how people who are sole CEOs without a real kind of safety net at work operate. I, I don't know because we are, um, we're very, we're very tight. Uh, I joke about it, but we have, we have, <laughs> the three of us have a Slack channel that we talk on and we have a text going and we also have an entire like DM conversation going on Instagram, all <laughs> entirely separate, but all at the same time. So, uh, so I rely very heavily on them and my husband's great and, you know, I'm, I'm very lucky, but I think it's when we try to really, you know, delineate and be like, I'm never doing anything work related and my home time and vice versa sets you up for failure. 
What is a song that motivates you to get going and pumps you up? There's a few, uh, and I'm actually laughing about it because I, I really was into Baby Shark, you know, and then there's the, the trite uh, Don't Stop Believing." My kind of secret and not so secret anymore is that when I get uh, nervous, if I'm giving a big presentation, I don't get as nervous as I used to, but I like to belt out Broadway songs just before because I really have to physically focus on how to do that and the lyrics and breathing and all of that stuff. And it makes me not think about the nerves and it kind of works some stuff out. So it's not a specific song, but Lame Is is, where, is my go-to. What are a few brands you dream of working with? Yes, we, we would love to be Sephora's influencer agency. It will probably not happen because they are fantastic at doing influencer marketing already. Uh, and as I said, beauty influencers were kind of the beginning. That's how a lot of people came to kind of think about influencer marketing was by watching makeup tutorials and they get products and everybody knows them and makeup artists on Instagram is, is a big thing. And Sephora has absolutely led the charge. However, we all love them and all their products and we would be happy to be paid in beauty products. So that's, that's my one. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here today and sharing your wisdom. I know I got a lot out of it and I'm sure others will as well. 